Hello Saints, today we're going to take a look at the book of Acts and we're going to look at why was it written, to whom was it written to, how does the book of Acts apply to and for us today. All questions that we need to answer and if we're going to be good stewards of the faith and the only way we can do that is by rightly dividing the word of God accordingly. Understanding the book of Acts is really the foundation to understanding how dispensations work and what is meant by right division. And these things are very important to understand first if you're ever going to understand the Bible. Now the book of Acts forms a bridge between the Gospels and Paul's epistles. And out there almost every commentator on the book of Acts maintains that its purpose is to show and tell the story of the the birth and growth of the church and this is a false assumption while the birth of the church is found in acts though not in the way most think luke's purpose for writing acts was actually far different the goal of this study is to examine the text and the structure and by doing that we'll uncover some of the answers to the questions now first we look at the author of the book of Acts and we know it's uh, the disciple Luke. The same Luke whose name titles the book of Luke. So one of the four gospels. In fact, examination of the book of Acts reveals that the author could have titled it Second Luke because Luke records the kingdom program, the dispensation of law slash kingdom leading into the mystery the secret yet to be revealed by the Apostle Paul, the gospel of grace, our gospel for today. So the book of Acts then is a book of actions that took place during the transition of dispensations. From one, uh, the first dispensation of law and over to the, the, their com uh, coming kingdom. And then it jumps over to the dispensation of grace. The Gospel of Paul revealed to him by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, the beginning, the beginning of Acts, we still see the Gospel that Jesus and the Twelve were preaching. It records much of what Peter says, okay, during the early part of the transition. We see early on in Peter's sermons that the book of Acts began with great hope for the nation of Israel. And we see the tragedies which took place as well. Now the nation of Israel commits a terrible sin in crucifying Jesus, their Messiah, their King. But a wonderful thing happens. Jesus Christ rises from the dead. So hope remained. They still had time to repent, to receive the kingdom under the reign of Christ Jesus. Now although it may seem that once Jesus was killed, it was all over for the promise of the earthly kingdom. But that's not the case. They still had a chance. And Peter understood this full well. Peter addresses the nation of Israel in Jerusalem on Pentecost. Remember, in Acts 2, Peter is still offering the king and the kingdom, and there's still an opportunity to repent and usher in their king, our Lord Jesus, and their Messiah Jesus. Now. At this point, it's extremely important to understand who Peter is addressing here. Peter is addressing the Jews, not the Gentiles. His message is exclusively to and for the Jewish nation. We see this in Acts 2.36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And we see the response in the next verse in 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then the next verse at 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now you'll notice at times when studying God's word, it's just as important to note that what it doesn't say versus what it does, does say. What's missing is a clue. Okay. Now notice here, Peter does not say that Christ had died for their sins and rose from the dead. 
And all they had to do to be saved is believe in the gospel. Peter doesn't say that. Instead, Peter continues to preach their gospel of the kingdom. To repent, be baptized. The same gospel that John the Baptist was preaching earlier on. In verse 38, Peter says to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice what Peter is declaring here. He says that in order to receive forgiveness and the Holy Spirit, they had to repent and be water baptized. Both repent, repentance and baptism were required under the dispensation of law slash coming kingdom to receive salvation. But notice this is under the kingdom program before the grace program is even revealed once Saul is converted to Paul. Now take a look at the kingdom program, the gospel here that Jesus says in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Again, in John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In Matthew 3, 1 through 6, And in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of, the, of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now something else very important to take note here is that Peter was preaching and speaking to both the individual Jew and the nation of Jews, the Jewish nation. Peter tells them each person who's Jewish okay, can be saved by repenting and being baptized. But in order for the Messiah to come for the entire nation, they all had to repent. There needed to be a national repentance. In other words, every single Jew had to obey to usher in their earthly kingdom. If you've ever noticed, when God wants to emphasize something, he repeats it three times. And we see this here. It's part of the structure of Acts. There's three rejections of the king by the Jews. In Acts 4, we see a threat by the Sanhedrin. In Acts 5, we see the imprisonment by the Sanhedrin. In Acts 7, we see execution by the Sanhedrin. Again, we see three rejections of the king under Paul's ministry in Acts 13, Acts 18, and Acts 28. Three rejections once again. We see three accounts of Paul's salvation as well. Once in Acts 9 near Damascus, again in Acts 22 in Jerusalem, and third in Acts 26 in Caesarea. We can even see three defenses that Paul uses before the Gentiles, before the rulers of the Gentiles in Acts 24, before Felix, in Acts 25, before Festus, in Acts 25 again, before Agrippa and Bernice. In order to understand the book of Acts, it's easier if you divide it into three sections. The first section, Acts 1 through 8, is all about the twelve and the assembly at Jerusalem. The gospel of the kingdom is preached to the Jewish nation, and there's nothing about Gentiles here whatsoever, just the Jews and their nation. And we see that some of the Jews responded favorably towards salvation, but the problem is the majority did not. And we see that rejection of the gospel grew widely and greatly, and ultimately it comes to a climax when they kill Stephen by stoning him to death their last chance and they blew it in the second section of the book of Acts we're looking at the time of Acts between uh, chapter 9 and 12 we see a shift first the focus was on Peter and the 12 and the gospel of the kingdom salvation by repentance and baptism but here in the second part we see a transition from what from that program over to Paul's program 
We see Saul converted in Acts 9, and he's commissioned as an apostle among the twelve, primarily an apostle to the Gentile nations. In Romans 11:13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So we see the transition from focusing on the Jews alone to now focusing on the Gentiles. Something big happens here. In Acts 10 and 11, we see God even telling Peter to go to the Gentiles. And he goes to Cornelius and leads him to salvation. In Acts 11, we see the creation of the first Gentile assembly, the church at Antioch. In Acts 12, Peter gets arrested. He's imprisoned, not by the Jews, but by King, uh, by Herod Agrippa I. And then he's released by the Lord. And we don't hear or see anything about Peter uh, again until 11 years later when he's involved with the Jerusalem council over in Acts 15. Now in the third section of Acts 13 through 28, Luke shifts his focus from the dispensation of the kingdom, the Jewish ministry, and he now puts his attention on to Paul, the new dispensation, the dispensation of grace under Paul's apostleship, the mystery gospel, to build a body of believers making us fellow heirs with Christ Jesus making us sons including men women and children now in this third section Paul first goes to the Jews then when they reject him he turns his attention fully to the Gentiles we see this taking place three times again in Acts 13 18 and 28 but take note that there's threes these threes that God used throughout the Bible here too we see that the Jews rejected Peter three times and then they reject Paul three times. In fact, the entire purpose of the book of Acts is to record as proof a testimony of facts that the Jews clearly rejected Peter and Paul, thereby rejecting salvation in Christ Jesus. Take a look at what Paul says here. Then see what the Jews respond with in Acts 13, 44-46. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, the Gentiles, but uh, the Jews, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Again, complete rejection by the Jews, and a clear statement made by Paul, that from then on, he was going to the nation of Gentiles instead. In Acts 18, 1-6, we see, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them and because he was of the same craft he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And finally, in Acts 28, 17 through 29, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Gentiles to, of the Jews together and when they were come together he said unto them men and brethren though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me but when the Jews spake against it I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, 
have I called for you to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed, after that Paul had spoken one word. Will spake, will spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing, ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing, ye shall see, and not understand perceive for the heart of this people is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it and when he had said these words the Jews departed and had a great reasoning among themselves now, there's been many times, even in my past, when I'd see false teachings and wonder what in the world, how in the world can they believe that, be teaching that? How can they be so off track with the gospel? Well, today, it's easy for me to see and understand all these false teachings, how they take place. First, you have to have false understanding. Then comes the false teaching. False understanding comes when you don't rightly divide God's word. And here we see a prime example in Acts. If you don't rightly divide Acts, you won't understand dispensations. You then believe that the entire book of Acts pertains to, to and for us today. And confusion sets in, then false teaching is born. Clearly, the book of Acts, as I've just shown you, is not all into for us today. It was for the Jews only, then we see the conversion, then we see Acts being for the body of Christ only. There's three parts, two Gospels, two disciples, the inner workings of Peter's Gospel of the Kingdom, salvation by repentance and baptism. Then we see that's done away with over to Paul's Gospel of salvation by faith alone, period. It's that simple. And it should be kept that simple. But there's a question. Why are there people out there on the streets today and in the churches today and all over the world screaming and proclaiming and telling people to repent and be baptized? Why? We now know why. They're preaching Peter's gospel. And somehow they've forgotten who Paul is. They're preaching the wrong gospel for today. The gospel for today is Paul's gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, but which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Listen, the purpose of Acts is not to record the birth of the body of Christ, although it does, but that's not the purpose for Acts. The purpose of Acts is to record the downfall of the nation of Israel, what happened, how they rejected their Messiah how God gave them still la these all these last chances to claim the earthly kingdom by national repentance. Then we see the repercussions of them not doing that. They refuse to repent. God sends them aside. He sets them aside. And then God turns to Paul, sending him as the apostle to the Gentiles. And when the fullness of the Gentiles is made complete, God will then revert back to the nation of Israel. This is going to happen after the body of Christ is raptured. It will happen during the 70th week of Daniel, what's commonly called the tribulation period. This is where God turns back to the Jews, folks.
and it has nothing to do with us today. We're going to be gone at that point. When Israel repents at the end of the tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week, when they call out to Jesus Christ as their Messiah and they believe, then Jesus will come back to set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. In Romans 11, 25 to 27, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now in closing, the book of Acts is a bridge between the dispensation of the law and their coming kingdom over to the dispensation of grace, the gospel of salvation by faith alone, Paul's gospel. While Peter's gospel concentrated on the earthly kingdom, Paul's message had nothing to do with the earthly kingdom. Paul's gospel is all about the heavenly kingdom, not the earth. The Jews will inherit the earth. The nation of Israel will inherit the earthly kingdom, the earth, and the body of Christ. We will inherit the heavenlies, the heavenly kingdom. Two locations, two programs, two destinations, two different entities entirely. It's important you understand this. Also, I want to point out here that none of the disciples were Gentiles, including Paul. Luke was a Jew, Paul was a Jew, Peter was a Jew, and so on and so on. Not one was a Gentile. There's confusion about this. Some still think that Paul was a Gentile, and now they're even claiming that Luke was a Gentile, and I've even heard some claim that John was a Gentile. No, none were Gentiles. All were Jews. So I hope this clears up for some of you out there who might be, have been struggling with the book of Acts, understanding that the book of Acts is a bridge from Peter to Paul, from one program to another, and we're in Paul's program today, not Peter's. This clears up some confusion, and the only way we can do that is by right division. It is the key once again, folks. Thanks for studying with me. Love, peace, grace, and Christ Jesus be with all of you out there, and I'll see you on the next video, Lord willing.